My name is Nora and I have the pleasure of introducing tonight's speaker. And uh, his extraordinary experience of researching the decolonization of Africa and his several books on understanding Namibia from different perspectives uh, makes him the right person to give us a better understanding of the long shadow of German colonialism with Namibia particularly in mind. So please let us welcome Professor Henning Melber. Good evening, everybody, and thank you. And thanks for the, uh, for the trust by applauding. If you should actually wait until the end of the evening and then decide if it's worth an applause or not. Uh, nice to welcome you. I've been with UF quite several times before, but since a few years not. So I'm glad to be back. And I hope I can share a few insights with you. You find stimulating, interesting, I have brought along a few material from the Nordic Africa Institute and uh, a leaflet on the forthcoming book. So feel free to help yourself. The Nordic Africa Institute has the biggest Africa library in all Nordic countries. And it's not only academic books, it's also fiction. So it's novels. And so when you, if you are interested in reading Gorna, who got the Nobel, uh, the Nobel Prize for Literature, all the books are there in the library. You can pick up and borrow them. It's worthwhile. It's not too far away from here. It's Villa Wegen. Uh, you could even walk, especially when it's such a nice day like today. Um, so feel free to check it out. The library is open, I think, every day for a few hours. You can check on the website. But the details are here. Thanks for the introduction, Nora. I should explain a bit more about my background, why I'm working on that. Now, you might pick up, I have a German accent. I'm indeed born in Germany, and I came as a son of immigrants to Namibia as a teenage boy. Um, by the time I finished school, then it was still Southwest Africa in the mid 1960s, settler colonial rule under apartheid. By the time I finished school, I considered Namibia as my home but with the emphasis on Namibia and not Southwest Africa. As a result, I joined the anti-colonial liberation movement SWAPO in the early 1970s, was then banned from entering Namibia and South Africa. I could only return after I was back in Germany against my will. I could return after independence. Then I got frustrated over what I call the limits to liberation, where I felt we betrayed the people. We did not live up to the promises. Namibia remains one of the most unequal societies in the world, despite being a very rich country, which didn't make me very popular with my comrades. Lucky enough, the Nordic Africa Institute in 1999 was looking for a first research director. And they gave me an indication they might be interested in me if I would apply. It was not a job offer, but it was an invitation to apply. And with the support of my family, I did apply. And in 2000, I got the job. So since then, I'm a Svensk Inwanderer. My Swedish is möke, möke, dolit, so for lot. Um, I'm still in touch with Namibia on a daily basis by reading the newspapers and so on. So I'm not speaking about an academic subject, despite the fact that I did a modest scholarly career on this subject and other subjects relating to African studies and development studies. But it is more a biographical engagement than um, purely scholarly. So I am, I try to be objective, but I'm not neutral. And you will very soon find that out. <laughs> um, we have discussed that I try to combine at least two aspects. That's the legacy of uh, colonialism in Germany today as a case study of colonial amnesia, 
which to some extent is also applicable for other former colonial empires, the UK, France, Belgium, you name it. And the difference will be, and I'll come to that at the beginning, is that uh, Germany stopped to be a direct physical colonial power with uh, World War I, in contrast to the other countries. Then I would like to recapitulate a little bit why colonialism continued in the mindsets and in structures uh, in Germany, in the different Germanys since then, and then highlight more recent tendencies where civil society, post-colonial initiatives, also scholars since the turn of the century managed to make inroads in the public sphere and end with the case study of Germany negotiating with Namibia on a government-to-government -government level how to come to terms which, with something which is accepted as the first genocide of the 20th century. And for all of that, 40 minutes, so let's see. I have the tendency, that's the problem if you, if you don't use PowerPoint but speak freely, that sometimes you are lost in footnotes and all of a sudden the time is is gone, but then you will have at least half an hour if I manage to stop at seven to ask me some questions on issues which you feel you would like to learn more. Is that okay? Well, what else should you say? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> at the turn of the 19th to the 20th century, Germany was the fourth biggest colonial empire. Even in Germany, they don't know that today. They think if they at all are aware that Germany has a colonial track record, they would say, yeah, but it's an anecdotal footnote of history. And that's how it also was until very recently presented in German textbooks. So through uh, transmission of information or rather non-transmission of information, you create a mindset which is blank of certain patterns in history. It's a bit like, uh, I would assume, so I didn't have a look in Sweden, that I would imagine there's not much in Swedish textbooks in schools about the slave trade and the Swedish involvement in the slave trade. Um, not that I would compare the two, but it's another example how transmission of knowledge in formal education can create awareness or can create blind spots. In Germany, the blind spot has been until very recently, actually until the beginning of this century, German colonialism. In textbooks, when you learned in Germany about colonialism, it was Belgian Congo, the famous example of the Belgian king. It was um, British uh, imperialism, India. It was maybe in passing France, that's it. But that Germany was the fourth biggest colonial power was not on record. Mind you, as little as it is in, on record that the third biggest colonial power was Russia which is an interesting, uh, one of the footnotes, I can't resist, because today Russia makes the point we've never colonized and Africans buy into that. And I'm usually then getting very angry and say, ask the Asians, uh, they can tell you a different story. So it's the same with selective history and creating official narratives. They started in 1884, the, Germany was a latecomer in colonialism, only after the German empire was created and Bismarck as the first chancellor was reluctant. Uh, there were domestic issues which basically contributed to the idea that joining the colonial powers means to elevate to the highest ranking European civilizations and creating uh, territories where Germans can emigrate to because they went to all the other countries, but not in own colonies, and it would make Germany rich. It all turned out to be an illusion. Uh, never ever did Germans in bigger numbers emigrate to the colonies. The biggest presence of Germans was in Southwest Africa as the only settler colony 
with at times including the 10,000 colonial soldiers, 15,000 people. That's it. So the emigration patterns did not change through the colonies. And the few who made profits in the colonies were the trading ho uh, houses, uh, were the military complex, um, and otherwise it was a deficit business for the German state because the costs of permanent warfare in basically all of these colonies were, was much higher than the return through plantation uh, economy and some other things. So it didn't work out, but it created this belief of German greatness. We are the civilizing nation because the equation was, we are the highest developed species of humankind Many of those we are colonizing are not even meeting the minimum standards of being human beings, and we bring them civilization. And if they dare to resist civilization because they don't want to give away the land they were occupying, then it's an act of civilization to kill them, exterminate the brutes. And I will come to that a little bit later when we discuss the genocide. Colonial expansion started with the proclamation of German Southwest Africa in 1884. And again, it's this labeling of a Eurocentric hierarchical view. It's the possession called German Southwest Africa. It was followed by Cameroon and Togo in West Africa, by East uh, German East Africa, which included parts of Tanzania, initially also Zanzibar, Rwanda, and Burundi, which later was then subdivided among the other colonial powers. And then they moved on. It was uh, Pacific Islands, many of them, too many in the South Sea to list them all individually. And it was as a, as a trusted territory, Kiaochu, a Chinese province, which strictly speaking, legally was not a colony, but it was transferred to Germany to be administrated, but it was administrated like a colony. Initially, the first 10, 15 years, very little happened. They were by name colonies. And that's a very interesting aspect to keep in mind. Very often, even with the best of intentions, the mistake is made to allocate to indigenous populations in these territories, also in other territories, the status of being the object of oppression, passive objects. They were actually very active local actors. And very often they had equal relationships with the colonizers, not only the German colonizers, also the French and the British colonizers. Trade relations where those local elites, they were of course also kind of class societies in these societies, where these local elites negotiated a good deal in their own interest. Some of them, even at the price of collaborating with the colonizers for their own benefits, and the colonizers were not from the beginning the strong force uh, who imposed what they wanted. When the indigenous people realized that the deals turned out to be not in their interest, they very often resorted to resistance. And then it became ugly because it also damaged the image of the colonizing powers. And again, it's not only Germany, only that Germany is the case I'm talking about. So it was a warfare in permanence in most of those colonies. You had literally hundreds of skirmishes, of uh, punishing expeditions, as they were called, with hundreds of thousands of uh, local people killed systematically. It culminated, as I said, in the first genocide of the 20th century. Before that was the so-called Boxer Rebellion, which was already um, a turning point in the history of violence, in particular by Germany, because at a time when those Chinese who resisted foreign domination against the French, against the British, 
were already uh, basically defeated. Germany sent troops and um, it was under the German emperor who had this infamous Hunnenrede where he said exterminate the brutes when he sent the soldiers in, I think it was 1902 to Kiao Chu and they did. They were looting, they were burning, they were raping, they were killing at a time where they were already victims. Now, interesting enough, and I come back to that again later, today's colonial apologists always insist with one standard argument. Well, those were different times. That was not considered to be unjust then. We consider it from today's perspective, injustice. But those were the times and everyone did like that. Very interesting, in 1899, there was the Hague Convention adopted by all the colonizing powers. And all their colonial warfare were in direct violation of what the Hague Convention in 1899 already stipulated. So even under the international law, then colonial warfare were in most cases a violation of the law. And it's also interesting to point out that throughout German colonialism, especially at the beginning of the 20th century, when it became so brutally um, in its uh, aggression, you had in the German parliament, Reichstag, debates on colonial rule, where not only the social democrats were very openly criticizing the German extermination strategies applied. You had colonial scandals openly discussed. You had a few cases where the public discourse even forced the government uh, to sack colonial officials because it became known what they did. One very prominent example is so-called Hänge Peters, Hanging Peters of East Africa, who was became known that he had executed uh, an African lover of him because she had, in his eyes, betrayed him with a local partner, he was, he had to resign, he was forced to retire. So you always, even then, had moral, ethical awareness, what is just and what is unjust, and what is a violation of the civilizing mission. So that argument, while those were different times, does strictly speaking not really hold water. You always had different views and people took different sides. I refer to the Social Democrats as a prominent example, but they are also a prominent example that they had quite a number of Social Democrats who were totally uncritically in favor of colonialism, who said this is in the interest of the working class. So it was not party political dividing lines. It was like on many issues even today on moral ethical compasses people had on the human rights concept they were willing to accept and take sides on. And that is not necessarily along party political lines. It's actually a cross-cutting issue. In the German parliament, there was one example of a member of parliament of a very small Christian party who was so upset about uh, when he learned that Nama prisoners of war were uh, sent uh, to West Africa and they basically 90% of them died because of the climatic conditions there. And he shouted out in, in parliament, but they are also human beings. Which is very interesting to take note of that this happened. I can't go into details. I will return to the genocide in Southwest Africa a little bit later. Came World War I, the Treaty of Versailles took away the colonies from Germany. And the official argument was a little bit hypocritical. They did not really civilize, they don't deserve to have colonies. Now, if you keep in mind that the, that argument came from the British Empire and what they did in India, for example, or Belgium and France, what they committed in crimes, then you think, okay, um, 
Those were the double standards of the time, which we are still living with today, double standards wherever we look. Um, double standards galore, uh, that could lead to another uh, discussion, maybe in a week or so, <laughs> using uh, the Ukraine and Gaza for double standards in global politics. Okay. <laughs> um, it did totally damage the German self-respect. How could the others dare to tell them they are not worth to have colonies? And the interesting psychological effect was that the colonial subject was more prominent in the Weimar Republic in terms of popular books, of textbooks, uh, of scholarly work than it was during the German colonial days. You had a renaissance of colonial literature which cultivated this pioneering spirit of the Germans who were denied their right to civilize the natives by those imperialist powers. So the Weimar Republic was actually more a propaganda forum for German colonialism than the German Kaiserreich was when it had the colonies. And in the early 1930s, one of the most prominent books was by Hans Grimm, Volk ohne Raum, People Without Space, published in the early 1990s. And the then just uh, voted into power Nazi regime displayed it as the only book at the World Exhibition in Chicago in 1934, I believe, as the highest cultural product of Germany, which also signaled that the colonial thought continued under the Nazi regime. They even had a minister for colonial affairs not a very relevant position, but there was a minister for colonial affairs. And the shift then took place in the 1930s of colonial expansion to the Eastern Europe side and not back to Africa, which was the initial slogan to say, bring back the colonies into the German empire. That shifted. And there is a very interesting uh, ongoing controversial debate between scholars to what extent German colonialism paved the way for the Nazi regime's expansion into Eastern Europe in terms of the mindset, in terms of the praxis, uh, practices, and in terms of the escalation into the Holocaust as a much more uh, systematic extermination strategy on an industrial scale. And it's very interesting that it's not only German scholars who get this idea. If you read Hannah Arendt's Origins of totalitarian rule. She refers back to German colonialism in Southwest Africa to say, if one wants to understand what happened in the Nazi regime, you have to look what happened in the German colonies, which was then trans transplanted into domestic policy three decades later in Germany. And Raphael Lemkin, who was the one who, who started to give the crime of crimes, as Winston Churchill called the Holocaust, the name genocide, a uh, Jewish lawyer from, uh, from, uh, from the, uh, a town now in uh, Lviv in uh, the Ukraine today, uh, he started in his writings on genocide with references to the German warfare in Southwest Africa, which he already said, that's a form of genocide. So it's also important for today to put it into that historical context. Um, I have to skip things, I'm sorry. That's the problem when you ask me to speak on such a subject. Um, <laughs> let me forget about all the other things about the Nazi regime. Uh, after World War II, we had two German states. And it was a bifurcation because they went very different ways in how they treated the colonial history. 
It was non-existent in the Federal Republic of Germany, in West Germany, didn't exist. To the extent that those people who were scholars supporting colonial uh, work made their career as geographers, as uh, ethnologists, and in some other uh, scholarly disciplines in West Germany. Konrad Adenauer, the chancellor of West Germany, he was the chairperson of the colonial association in the 1930s in Germany. Um, so you had this tendency, colonialism didn't exist. Yes, they started to deal with the Holocaust reluctantly at the beginning and thanks to mainly people my age, a few years older, but basically my generation, those post-World War II people, uh, they had to become more serious in the late 1960s and the 1970s dealing with the Holocaust. But that meant also that there was nothing before the Holocaust. I will come back to that uh, in a few minutes again, because it was almost like a mental block. We deal with the Holocaust, and that's the end of history in the way of looking back. There was no history before the Holocaust. The trauma of the Holocaust is the point of departure for dealing with German history. And everything before were the good old days when democracy started to emerge in the German Kaiserreich, uh, the Weimar Republic, and then came the nasty Nazis who destroyed everything with which we now have to deal. Colonialism, non-issue. The GDR, East Germany, took a very different trajectory. First of all, all the Nazis disappeared like a miracle from the first day of the GDR state. They were non-existent. There never were any Nazis in the GDR. At a closer look, some of them were even in the higher hierarchies of the uh, Central Committee and so on. But point one was, the GDR had nothing to do with the Nazi era, but it had the colonial archives, which were in Potsdam, and it had historians who were keen to make use of the opportunity and access the archives in Potsdam. So already since the mid 1950s and later, supported by the official government, GDR historians produced an impressive range of serious scholarly work dealing with German colonialism and its effects. Very often really absolutely credible based on resource work, proper resource work. In most cases, unfortunately, with a one or two page preface in which reference was made to the latest decisions of the Central Committee of the SED, those things to wrap it up and package it as part of the anti-imperialist um, message in the Cold War era, which was used in West Germany to totally discredit all the research. Because they said, ideologically blind communists who only wanted to discredit the West, you can't give it any credibility. If you looked at the work, it's until the very day, very credible work. And some of the work, even 50 years later, 60 years later, is absolutely relevant to come to terms with what happened in the German colonies. In contrast, in West Germany, I vividly remember in 1984, the 100th anniversary of the so-called Berlin Conference, when in 1884, this conference paved the way formally for Germany's entry into the world of colonizing powers and the subdivision of the African continent. In 1984, there were the first few civil society initiatives, to some extent related to churches, um, left student circles, who tried to raise the issue but predominantly the books and articles published in 1984 in West Germany were colonial apologetic. And they used something I usually call the Autobahn argument, 
which was a popular reference, not any longer, but at those days where you said, yeah, yeah, Hitler was bad, but he built the Autobahn. So the Autobahn argument means, yeah, not everything in German colonialism was okay, but they were fighting the sleeping sickness, they introduced education, they were building roads. Remember what Bertolt Brecht said, who built the roads? The slaves, the workers, not those who claim they built the roads. But that was the Autobahn argument, which still was predominant 40 years ago in West Germany, where it was almost impossible to get any critical discourse into the public sphere through dominant media. It, it were the side on the side of public discourse that you had a few voices. With German unification, gradually in the 1990s, the public discourse started to change. Not least because you had a younger generation of scholars who started to discover the colonial subject. And they did so by raising um, issues, not least on uh, the history of Southwest Africa as the most prominent example, because Southwest Africa became independent as Namibia in 1990. And the German parliament already in 1989, in anticipation of independence, declared a special responsibility for the independent state. Now, if you assume that special re responsibility was based on the argument, we did harm there, so we have a special responsibility. That was not the reason. The reason was, this was the only country of the former colonies where there still was a substantial number of German speaking whites. Actually more then in 1990 than there were at the end of the colonial rule. And the special responsibility was linked to the Germans in Namibia. So much about patronizing and taking care. They were taking care of the Germans there. But it brought into the public domain the interest what's going on, not so much with any of the other colonies, but it reinforced the special status that Southwest Africa and then Namibia had in the German public awareness. And the first works in the late 1990s produced not only on Namibia, but also on other colonies, very critical analysis on the German colonial rule, which complemented the, the earlier works which I talked about in the GDR. So by the turn of the century, one could say there were shifting grounds in the German discourse. The first efforts of critically analyzing German textbooks about the blind spots on German colonialism, uh, discourses which managed to enter public institutions where people said, if we are serious about dealing with the past, we have not only to deal with the Holocaust, we should actually go back a little bit further which was always a very tricky issue because it also touched, it touched on a parallel debate, German responsibility for two world wars. There was a, a, a German historian, Fritz Fischer in Hamburg, who brought forward that argument and he was entirely marginalized because he dared to say Germany had ultimate responsibility for two world wars, triggering two world wars. So it was always a bit of a touchy issue also if you go back in history and you say, but shouldn't we start thinking what happened in German colonial times to better understand what happened thereafter? Then came more by accident in 2015, a situation at a time when already um, agencies of the Ova Herero and the Nama, the main descend the descendants of the victim groups, put forward demands that Germany needs to deal with the genocide, that more by accident something unplanned happened. German parliament followed the French parliament's example 
and declared what happened to the Armenians as genocide. And the Turkish president Erdogan flipped out completely and accused the Germans in public very efficiently. How dare they accusing them of a genocide, which of course they never committed, while they committed the first genocide of the 20th century in their colony, Southwest Africa, which by the way, was at that time already officially recognized as the first genocide of the 20th century, even by a study of ECOSOC, which was undertaken, I think in the early 1990s. So it was not something new that Erdogan raised. He pointed out and said, what are you doing? Which became such an embarrassment that at that time in mid 2015, even the president of the German parliament from the Christian Democratic Union, so not a leftist party, in an opinion article declared, this is indeed, as the speech would say, peen summer. So we should do something about it. And what they did about it was that finally in a press conference, in passing, when journalists who had raised the issue in the public domain repeatedly asked, what about the genocide in Southwest Africa? The press spokesperson for the foreign ministry somehow flippantly said, if you want to call it genocide, call it genocide. That is until the very day, since then in 2015, the only official confirmation that what happened in Southwest Africa was considered a genocide. But as a result, Germany entered with the Namibian government bilateral negotiations, how to come to terms with what is called a genocide. And one could now say, that's fantastic. Germany again becomes the world champion of commemoration. No other former colonial power dared to do such a step, which is true. And I think then the Germans dawned that they have to be very careful not to open a Pandora's box. Because the risk to create a precedence in negotiating how to come to terms with a colonial atrocity might create a precedence of far reaching effect. And I'm not in any way a fan of conspiracy theories, but I'm totally convinced the moment Germany started to negotiate the genocide with Namibia, it became an issue behind closed doors between foreign ministers in Brussels, the EU. It was also interesting to see that international media very prominently reported about it because it indeed became too close to comfort. If a colonial power, especially with the history of Germany, which basically scored 10 out of 10, the way it dealt with the Holocaust, starts to negotiate about the genocide in Southwest Africa. So right from the beginning, those negotiations were a flop because Germany negotiated how to apologize and avoided the term reparations and said it's a genocide from today's perspective. Now just imagine for a moment, you would be in the shoes of the Ovaherero and Nama and Damara in Namibia today whose forefathers were exterminated. And the colonial power says, yeah, we committed a genocide from today's perspective. Let's negotiate how we apologize. But that's insult to injury. The legal background to that is, of course, a um, motto which already was issued in 2004 by the then German Foreign Minister Joschka Fischer, when the issue was raised for the first time, a hundred years after the beginning of that genocide, where he said, no excuse or apology 
which has relevance for reparations. So if you unconditionally apologize, then in legal terms for a genocide, then in legal terms, you enter a commitment for reparations. That is international law codified in the meantime. So Germany had to avoid an apology which qualifies under this codified law. It had to avoid to give unconditional recognition to a genocide. Therefore, the phrase genocide from today's perspective, which brings into the picture the notion of intertemporality. And I've touched on it a little bit already at the beginning. Intertemporality in international law means you can't apply today's criteria on things that happened then, which we would now consider as unjust, but were legally correct laws of the time. That's the principle of intertemporality, which Germany herself doesn't follow strictly. It would never say that the laws in the Nazi regime were just, of course not. So where is the intertemporality? Because that would be the argument. Well, that was the Nazi regime and those laws, they were the laws of the day. So it was not unjust. They also, which is actually making it more of a double standard, did not respect or recognize the laws of the former GDR as just and legally acceptable. They actually transformed property relations in the GDR, which would have been legal under the GDR laws, with the argument those were unjust laws. So there are at least two cases where Germany herself totally ignores the principle of intertemporality. And when it comes to the argument it's a genocide from today's perspective, the reasoning is the Genocide Convention was only adopted in 1948 and ratified by sufficient states in 1953. Therefore, it could not have been genocide. Imagine for one moment with that argument, a German would say the Holocaust was a genocide from today's perspective. Can you imagine what would happen? So you again have these different criteria applied opportunistically when it comes to how you want to get away with something. I have numerous examples to illustrate that until as late as end of January this year, which because the time is up, I can't use. Um, next time we have three hours. Is that okay? <laughs> I, I have to, to leave that all out. The bilateral negotiations got stuck. In May 2021, the two special envoys appointed by the governments initialed a joint declaration. And the intention was that within weeks, that joint declaration would be signed and officially become effective by the two foreign ministers. This joint declaration has not been signed until the very day. And it's dubious if it will be signed. One of the main obstacles, not for the two governments, but from the point of view of uh, the many Namibians and even seven special rapporteurs of the United Nations Council for Human Rights, is that the negotiated joint declaration happened on a bilateral government to government level. But both governments had also signed a convention of, indeed, of the rights of indig indigenous people. And that convention clearly stipulates any matter of direct relevance for indigenous people requires their direct participation, which is used by the Ovaherero and the Nama and the Damara to say, you are violating the convention you signed because you left us out. That might not be necessarily good enough for the two governments to not sign. Germany definitely wants to sign desperately, 
The Namibian government is a little bit sitting on the fence, not so sure. There are elections uh, in November this year. They are not so sure if they now sign. And there were some, some uh, really bad vibes coming across earlier this year through Gaza, quickly, and then I, I stop. You have certainly followed the issues on Gaza with South Africa uh, bringing the case to the International Court of uh, Justice, not least because of the shared experiences of being uh, under apartheid earlier. Namibia supported the South African claim. It has now also submitted a claim. While Germany submitted to be third party to Israel on the 12th of January. That was the day when the first war acts started 120 years ago in Southwest Africa. And the German president freaked out completely. He lost it totally. He put a statement on X, previously Twitter, where he said, who are you to dare to do that while you're not coming to terms with the first genocide you committed against us? So in the light of the pending signing of the joint declaration, that is another twist in the developments, which was then even reinforced when on the 27th of January, the German embassy in Windhoek posted on X again something to remember the Holocaust Remembrance Day. It's the 27th of January. And they had staff of the German embassy in Windhoek holding up signs which together read, we remember. In the presence of a person wearing traditional Jewish cloth. No Herero cloth, no Nama cloth. The 27th of January was at the same time when it commemorated the closure of the concentration camps, the closure of the first concentration camps in Southwest Africa in 1908. And this, and there I end, this brings to the four, the actually most fundamental problem when we discuss colonial amnesia, that previous colonizers and their descendants seem to be unable to understand the perceptions of the descendants of those who then were the victims. It's such a degree of insensitivity. One could say they were not even aware of what they are doing, which is actually the worst part of it. They are not aware of what they are doing. While for Germans, colonialism in Namibia is a footnote and you want to come to terms with it, today's daily realities in Namibia show that colonialism is not history, it's present. Half of the country's area is commercial farmland. Out of that commercial farmland, which all is in the areas where those local communities who were the victims of the genocide were living and who were appropriated from the land, half, 70% uh, of those 50% of the total area of Namibia are still in the white possession ownership. And a majority of the white commercial farmers are German speaking. So even if they were not the ones who took the land from them, the perception is a constant reminder, colonialism has not ended. Colonialism remains in place in Namibia today. To the extent that if the private owned land, the, the owner does not like that over Herero or Nama want to visit the ancestral graves, he could say, you stay out here because that's my private property. So the fundamental problem is that, 
and I'm sure it applies to any other colonizing power as well, that those descendants of colonizing states have internalized mindsets and values who prevent them from being able to understand what on the other side is reality. And as a last word, bilateral negotiations between governments are certainly important as facilitating reconciliation as much as reconciliation is possible. But those who have to reconcile are the ordinary people. It's not a matter confined to governments. And if you leave out the people, you won't achieve reconciliation. Mm. It's amazing how time runs. <laughs> Would you like to manage the question for yourself or you want to? Well, it's okay, yeah. Okay. Just raise your hand so you have a question. Uh, well, thank you much for a very interesting lecture. Um, I was just wondering because in the media around other colonial empires, especially the English and the French, been a lot of talk about artifacts getting back things from the British Museum or the Louvre. Is that significant in any way in the German debate as well? Yeah, it is. Should I, I answer directly and then we see? Is that okay? It is, especially when it comes to human remains. Uh, there was a study now undertaken. They estimate that uh, 19,000 human remains might be in. German archives, in museums, in hospitals, which were mainly coming from the German colonial era, mainly from then Southwest Africa and from East Africa, but also from other colonies. So it starts with human remains, which is very much in your face, of course, an issue. Um, people want to bury their ancestors. They want to have them back. But there are many uh, artifacts, cultural artifacts. Um, Germany actually tried there again to be a step ahead of others. I mean, if you follow what the UK blocks when it comes to Greece, um, Germany is ahead of the curve when it comes to that, but still very much at the beginning. But they have returned Benin bronzes to Nigeria. But then you need to have a closer look. They are borrowed. They have returned them, but they remain in possession of them. So sometimes um, the interest is in the small written, you know, in the contracts. Um, they are eager. They have put aside um, public finances to do proper research on restitution. There are numerous issues coming up. Um, one of them is to conserve the cultural artifacts. They are toxic in the meantime, with pesticides and whatever, you know. So actually returning them would mean, oh, there's a health risk. So, I mean, the closer you look into the details, the more complicated it gets. Another complication is, to whom do you return them? It's not the societies they used to be. To whom do you return the Benin bronzes? The Nigerian state? No, of course not. And they are the same in Namibia, where the, where the Linden Museum returns three very important, highly symbolic uh, artifacts, um, which came from Hendrik Whitboy, Whitboy in the Nama community. The Nama want to have them, not the Namibian state. So when the Namibian state receives them, the Nama say, but these are our possession. What are you doing with them? So it's a very complicated issue. There's another additional aspect which still underlines the unfortunate asymmetric relations in our world. There's quite a number of scholars from those societies who get very upset because they say, we follow the debate on restitution, 
and we observe its Western scholars who make a career debating restitution. So you reproduce the hierarchical system by people like me talking about the subject and making a career. And those who are actually the ones who should have the voice and the agency remain marginalized or sometimes even voiceless. So it's a very tricky issue, but it's, it's maybe an issue easier to approach because uh, it's not the issue of reparations. You can say, okay, we find the deal, you get some of those things back or you, you get the ownership, but we, they are, remain with us as borrowed as exhibits, then comes the argument, do you have the facilities? Otherwise you begin, give them back and they rot. It's a bit like, you know, you steal something from someone and you say, why should I give it back to you? You don't have the provisions to take care of it. It's, but restitution is of course a huge issue. And again, at a closer look, it shows the, the hierarchies which are still in existence and play out. Thank you. Uh, yes. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for a great presentation. Um, I actually have two questions uh, that are kind of related, but the first one is in a more polarized world. Uh, how are Namibian attitudes today towards the West, Russia and uh, China, for example? Uh, and the other, uh, you say, a solution for reconciliation needs to involve the people. And you, you who uh, have a lot more knowledge about uh, Namibia today, are there any like, specific examples or requests from the people that you can see today? I haven't properly understood the second question. You have to repeat it when I answer the first one. Is that okay? Of course. Um, I made several times reference to double standards. They are a global phenomenon. If there is something the whole world shares, then it's double standards. Only that they play out differently. Um, Namibia did never criticize Russia for the invasion of the Ukraine, despite the fact that the Namibian constitution has territorial integrity as a sacrosanct principle. They buy into the argument Russia never colonized, where then I sometimes a bit flippantly say, so how do you explain that Russians who didn't want to be conscripted use a canoe and manage to get away over to Alaska? If Russia borders to Alaska, how could they never have colonized? But these are double standards, similar to China, where China is an all-weather friend of uh, Namibia. And uh, they are willing to, while they emphasize territorial integrity, um, the right to sovereignty and self-determination when it comes to Palestine, rightly so, when it comes to Western Sahara, rightly so, it seems the Ukraine does not qualify to these entitlements. And uh, often references made, Russia supported us in our anti-colonial struggle. Yeah, well, but the Ukraine was part of the Soviet Union. And the personal doctor of uh, the first president of Namibia, Sem Nuyoma, was trained in Kiev, not in Moscow. So again, it's this selectivity where perceptions are totally blurred, where you say, but what, what is going on? So what they are now accusing Germany of when it comes to Gaza, rightly so, is something they apply generously themselves. The same applies to South Africa when it comes to closing their eyes and ears when it comes to the Russian warfare against the Ukraine. So, so much about double standards. It's really... I think you will not find a single country in the world, maybe, maybe Malta or Luxembourg, I don't know, uh, but otherwise with any international interests 
who would not apply double standards. Where that's, I think that's one of the uh, cracks of the matter we are confronted today. Uh, the global normative frameworks are so much under stress, like never before, because you have the different interests with different interpretations that you would say there's not really a normative framework they all are willing to relate to. It's, it's non-existent. If that's enough as an answer, you can repeat your second question, please, and speak a bit louder. Uh, yes, of course. Uh, uh, thank you for the answer. And uh, the second question was, uh, you said a solution for reconciliation uh, needs to uh, uh, be uh, together with the people. And can you uh, see or hear about like any certain requests that comes from the people of what could be done uh, to reach reconciliation? Well, I say that based on experiences, the German-French reconciliation, the German-Polish reconciliation, in starting from the late 1950s throughout the 1960s and then the 1970s when it came to Eastern Europe, were based on meetings from people to people. They were organized on people meeting, sharing their experiences, discussing the future. That is how reconciliation works. Völkerfreundschaft, friendship among peoples. It's not on a level where states declare we are now friends. As I said, as a facilitating, um, framework, fine, but then you have to put money where your mouth is and you have to bring the people together to listen to each other. Listening is more important than talking for both sides and sharing the different backgrounds with the intent to understand better the other one. That is, I believe, true friendship between peoples, which applies, of course, also in domestic dimensions. I think the Sami are not enough listened to in Sweden. That is a domestic dimension where you say you need to have more interaction where people are willing to come together to listen and to understand why are they objecting against mining in their, in their homeland. So that, that kind of things. People are the basic fundament for building sustainable friendships. And you need to understand the other. And you can't do that merely by a programmatic declaration which two governments signed. So the mere fact that the main agencies of the victims of the genocide were not invited to the negotiation table on the bilateral negotiations between Germany and Namibia, already programmed a failure of reconciliation. What difference would it be if there would be recognized representatives of the Ovaherero, of the Nama, of the Damara, sitting at the negotiating table, eye to eye with the representatives of the German government? and explain their desire, their feelings, and the German government representatives listening, and maybe inviting representatives of post-colonial movements in Germany, inviting Afro-Germans to come to the same table and discuss the matter. So that, that I be, and there are examples as I said, inner European examples that come to my mind. Or another example that comes to my mind, I said Germany added insult to injury. They never apologized for what they committed as crimes in Southwest Africa. There were numerous highest ranking representatives of German governments visiting Namibia. Not one of them did what Willy Brandt did 50 years ago at the war memorial in Warsaw, where in a spontaneous act, he bent his knees 
that was so much more powerful than any negotiated agreement as an act of humility and symbolism. It was basically a turning point in German relations with Eastern Europe. Why can they not do something like that to previously colonized people? What do they think? It's not about money. They always say it's not about money. Yes, it's about land. We want our land back. Land is with identity. In those bilateral negotiations, Germany never offered to put aside money to buy the land and return it to the Ovaherero and the Nama. Sorry, I'm getting. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, thank you for the amazing lecture and uh, I um, uh, was wondering uh, you you mentioned the whole um, the German colonialism the genocides and uh, you mentioned how like what well, more than how was 70% of all arable land was owned by white germans or the, uh, like that and i um, i was uh, searching up a, a few other uh, uh, things as a legacy of german german colonialism apparently according to the duolingo data uh, that namibia is the only country outside of europe where german is the most popular language uh, was learned on the app, and I would say that um, given, uh, would you say, uh, say that these uh, uh, these land appropriation or these genocides, would you say that they are the greatest uh, legacy of of uh, the German colonialism in Namibia, or what would you consider to be the the uh, the biggest or most lasting legacy be, uh, of the German colonial government? in German South West Africa? I don't think it's the German language <laughs> that's the biggest legacy. It's, uh, it's true, but that's the point I mentioned in passing before. At the moment, there are more German speakers living in Namibia than during the German colonial times. Um, it's a very prominent place for German pensioners. Um, the Swedes go to Portugal and Spain, the Germans too, but they also have discovered Namibia. There is a coastal town of Swakopmund, and you have hundreds of German rentiers there because with the, with the pension they get, they can live like in luxury there. And um, it's you still have uh, remnants of a German colonial past. The ordinary Namibians have a very mixed feeling about the German legacy especially the land issue, but also through other things. Well, Namibia has a state, uh, a state radio station in German language. Namibia has a German daily newspaper, which is a private one, but Monday to Friday, you have a German daily newspaper in Namibia. You have German clubs, you have private uh, clubs, you have sports clubs in German, you have Nacht der Schlager, meaning the night of uh, pop songs taking place where they fly in um, people that are hardly any, any longer known in Germany who are singing their old their oldies there and you have Oktoberfest. Uh, so you could say uh, Namibian society is very much impregnated by um, artifacts of German culture. But it's a very ambiguous feeling. And they are rightly so rather sensitive when it comes to lecturing, which is a German virtue. You know, Germans like to lecture. They know it better. Not a good idea. Um, and when it comes to the property relations, the German minority in Namibia is the by far wealthiest population group. They are the best of population group in Namibia. There, there is a... a Every five years a population census, and they also measure income and so on. Uh, the German-speaking uh, Namibians have the same level of income and living standard as the Nordic countries. And 
in comparison, the the San population, the Bushmen, is one fiftieth of that. So that gives you an idea is when it comes to the internal inequalities, then the Germans are the projection area of the colonial legacy. They are privileged because of the colonial history. That's the perception, even if it not necessarily applies to each and every individual of the Germans. OK, thank you very much for your lecture. I, I have a lot. <laughs> but I will condense it into one small thing. I've had the privilege of, of living and working in Namibia for the past six years, before I started my, 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 my journey in Sweden. And coming from Zimbabwe and having my own, you know, background with, with British colonialism and colon, colonial um, amnesia, as you said, you know, I, I got really jarred when one of the things I was watching a documentary and they said there's one individual who owns 50,000 hectares of land owned by one person. So that's like 50,000 football fields. Yeah. And when he was asked why he owns so much land and why he doesn't, you know, by the opposition and stuff. And his justification was, if my animals are in one part of the world, you know, one part of my land and it gets dry and it's raining in another part, then they can go there and do all sorts of things. So these are some of the conversations that are happening. And I feel like there's, there's a shift to sort of like just, you know, add to what someone was asking in terms of what, people are thinking, especially from the younger people, there's, there's a lot of anger. But then my question then comes to you, because Steinmeier at the recent funeral of Hage Gengob, uh, the former president who just passed away, um, said, oh, I think it's time that an apology is issued by Germany. And a lot of you know the groups, Herero, the Namas, um, did not like that because it was like, okay, it's almost like, again, another slap in the face. And this has been happening continuously. Um, but then there's also the conversation that Hage Gingob did not do enough, uh, also as an individual of, you know, that particular descent as well, like when he was in power, when he was the president, he did not do enough to sort of advocate for this. Do you think this, this whole conversation is now being used as a political pawn or looking at local politics um, with the election that's coming up and all, all sorts of things? Do you think that people are now just using this now as a point of like, okay, we need, you know, to have representation. And if I fight for, for the Namas and for the, you know, and for the Hereros, you know, then I'm the guy to back. And then I, I can, by some miracle, unseat Swapo, you know, <laughs> going forward. What do you think? You touch on another very tricky issue. I'm sure you're aware of it. Yeah. That the Namibian government is not in the few of the over Herero and the yeah. Nama and the Damara adequately representing them. Yeah. They are minority groups. And what has become a taboo, understandably so, is the demographic consequences of the genocide. Yeah. If 60 to 80 percent of the over Herero and 50 percent of the Nama were exterminated 120 years ago, then you know why they are today a minority population group in Namibia. And the government is based on the majority population group of the Oshivambo speaking people in the north who were never directly colonized in the sense they never were appropriated from the land. They always maintained the land. But now you have a government which has that history in the north of Namibia yeah. And you have the Ova Herero and the Nama and the Damara in the central, western, and southern parts of the territory where commercial agriculture takes place, where ownership has changed by violent means, and they are the landless now. So they don't feel adequately represented by that government. That is one of the tensions, inbuilt tensions, of course, where they say, you betray us, and you did not bring us to the table to negotiate with the German government. Comparing the Zimbabwean issue with the Namibian, there's one major flaw. I'm sure you're aware of it. Yeah. It's very difficult to live from the land in Namibia. Yes, yeah. It's not the last places I know from Zimbabwe <laughs> where you can do with two hectares and you can provide uh, sufficient food for your family throughout the year. That's why you have farms of 50,000 hectares. When we were coming to Namibia, we were living on the then uh, 
not owing them, but uh, living on uh, the biggest private farm in Namibia with 70,000 hectares. Yeah. But the carrying capacity of the 70,000 hectares was 10,000 caracul sheep. Per sheep, you needed seven hectares. That gives you an idea. Yeah. That was in the southern part with an annual rainfall of 200 to 300 millimeters. What can you do? You have patches in Namibia, also more to the north in the communal farming areas with sufficient rain, where you can produce millet, where you can produce maize. Yes. But the challenge is, of course, how to live from land under those climatic conditions, especially in times of climate change. So that requires a different concept, which is possible, but which both the Namibian and the German government failed to provide. That would be another challenge. So you have so many layers, different layers that complicate the matters that it would not be a straightforward answer how to solve all the problems. But one of the problems is to solve the domestic tensions yeah. between the descendants of the main victim groups and the government. And Hagi Gangob was not the person who had the willingness to address it, despite the fact that he did not come from the north of Namibia. Um, he was on his way to the United Nations in New York in September at a stopover in Paris, where he presented a lecture to students at a, a Paris university. And in the discussion, he was asked about that, the genocide in Southwest Africa. And his answer was then, well, after the genocide, we had the South African apartheid and that was much worse. Now you can imagine what the effect was. Yeah on the Ova Herero and the Nama and the Damara back home. So the, all these layers which you have, you have them in Germany, where basically the Holocaust is a closed layer, nothing below that is basically accessible in the sense that there would be an open mind to deal with it. And you have other layers in Namibia where the dominant perceptions of those in government are not directly understanding to pick up the wipes of the descendants of the main victim groups. And that's one of the, one of the many challenges. Yeah. Um, okay, I think we have to wrap it up. Um, thank you so much for coming. Do ask me afterwards. <laughs> oh. Thank you so much for coming, it was super happy. Thank you. Thank you. My wife will be delighted. Yeah. <laughs>